Hello and welcome to 404 Not Found. Yes, the world's only TV show, unaccountably nostalgic for the early to mid 1990s. Oh yeah, Commodore Amigas, Atari yeah. STs. Logging on to BBSs. <sighs> laughing at people who don't know who William Gibson is. <laughs> Anyway, in tonight's unofficial hot list of the Internet Underground, meet the man who's made a way of listening to MP3s on the move. Plus, we ask the self-styled queen of cyberpunk, whatever happened to virtual reality? And cyberpunk, uh, for that matter. Yes, and but before ye merriment can commence, some serious news. <laughs> Big Blue have come over all tiny this week with the announcement of the world's smallest hard drive. Measuring just one inch square, the pocket-sized storage device can hold up to 340 megabytes. IBM hopes to see it being used in digital cameras and PDAs by 1999. Unfortunately, the forgetful giant has decided to call their new technology the Micro Drive. Exactly the same name chosen by Clive Sinclair 15 years ago to launch his similarly sized, notoriously rubbish extension for the ZX Spectrum. Will Uncle Clive sue? Oh, well, IBM follow up with a 16K RAM pack and thermal printer for their ThinkPad range. Time will tell. Also having problems with the little ones this week was chirpy Steve Ballmer, Microsoft's number two. While his boss continues being quizzed by the Department of Justice over possible monopolistic behaviour, he chose to be interrogated by a bunch of American primary school kids instead. Will computers get so advanced they can take over the world? Asked one youngster. Computers can only do what humans tell them to do, said Bulmer, chuckling. Has Microsoft met all its goals in the computer world, was the next question. Oh no, said Bulmer, turning more sinister. We haven't even begun to get started yet. What exactly is he telling his computers to do? And in our irregular hack of the week spot, we tip our hat to the Nets Game Boy hackers. We say, if you haven't already played with the official Game Boy camera and printer, you haven't lived. But if afterwards, like these guys, you took the printer and camera apart in your garage and then worked out how to connect it to a PC to make an ultra-cheap digital camera and ultra-stupid titchy printer, well, you probably haven't lived much either. But you've been having fun, and that's the important thing, isn't it? Mm. I guess it means your jive about thermal printers for the PC turned out to be true. After all. An exhaustive news feed, Dave, but you know... It poses the question, doesn't it? Whatever happened to those other mad predictions of the 80s? That, that one day we'd all have powerful PCs and every appliance in the house, uh, internet connections everywhere we went, almost literally in our pants. Well, it never happened, did it, Dad? Those useless technology companies never got their acts together, as usual. Well, Dave, that's your mental challenge for this week, isn't mm -hmm. it? Find me... David, some company, someone, somewhere, anywhere, who stuck a PC, somewhere, a PC doesn't usually go. <laughs> oh dear. And they're heading for the, the grim part of Leamington Spa. I've come to sunny Leamington Spa to meet programmer Hugo Fines, who stuck a PC into his car stereo to play back MP3 files. So how did you get the idea for this in-car hyper? Well, it was just basically because there was no room for a CD auto changer, so um, I built a computer to stick in here instead. So, where's the hardware? Well, inside this bit, I'm going to take the top off, is the power supply, um, which this one converts all the battery voltage into stuff suitable for the computer. And in here we've got a little PIC, which is a small microprocessor, which scans the keypad, and this runs the whole time it's plugged into the car, whether or not the main computer's on. It starts and stops the main computer. Um, and then in this bit is the fun part. In this bit is a PC, which is called the Biscuit PC, um, which is a complete PC with sound and graphics and video and everything in it, and a Pentium 166 and 16 megs of RAM, just in a teeny little box. And that all, it has the sound and everything, and it all comes out through these wires to a couple of connectors on the back. We've got like, sound ones at the back, and um, one for the keypad and stuff. And there's lots of like cooling holes to make sure it doesn't get too hot. And inside of the lid is the hard disk. Oh, which right. is... oh can, can we see that? It's like... Oh, it's, it's one of these tiny little laptop hard, hard drives. Yeah, it's only a teeny little thing which is very in inexpertly shock mounted on bits of rubber. So um, it's uh, you know, really professionally done. Um, but it hasn't gone wrong yet. 
so that's quite good. I plug the pair in, and that thing goes in first. And then I plug the keypad and stuff in, and Ethernet and everything like that. And the top starts to come off because I haven't screwed it on. And plug in the audio left and right, and that's it. All done. Right, so how do you communicate with it, with it if it hasn't got any keyboard well, or monitor or anything? Well, it hasn't yet. The, Basically, um, we have a phone keypad here, yeah. which is hooked up to the little PIC computer, which I pointed out before, which, um, when you press buttons, it turns them into serial codes and sends them into the COM port 1, um, which is how you talk to it. Uh, if you want to put tunes and stuff onto it, there's an Ethernet cable here, which you plug into your laptop, which is quite useful because it means you can put loads of stuff on it um, just by sitting in the car with a laptop. Which you look a bit silly, but especially if you're in there for hours fixing bugs, but, you know, it does work, so there's that. And then uh, to see what happens on it, there's a little screen, which um, is like, it's not just like the one out of a fruit machine, it's actually out of a fruit machine. Um, a friend of mine had one of these, it's a fruit machine spare, um, and I just put that in the little coin tray, which looks, you know, quite professional. And then the audio comes in here, uh, which has got a little CD input jack onto oh, the front fantastic. of the stereo. So um, that's all there is to it, really. Cool. I mean, so so will we will we be able to see it working? Uh, yes. I just want to start the engine though, because right. um, due to some yeah. Well, I'll start the engine. Well, that was fascinating, Dave. Uh, I've really only got one question, um, which is um, what 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 are M MPEG threes exactly? Uh, or MP threes, as we're calling them nowadays. It actually stands for it's not third MPEG standard, which oh, of thank God for stands that. for Motion Picture Experts Group, but we needn't go into that. That's not important right now. now. Um, no, M MP3s stand for MPEG-1 Layer 3, and basically it's a way of compressing sound. Essentially, it means you can take the enormous amount of data that you've got on a normal CD data file and right. <laughs> take that and squeeze it down by 10 times. So, in fact, what you what you uh, effectively end up with is that whereas like normally a, C, uh, a a single track on a CD would be about thirty or forty megabytes, you can get it down to about three or four. That's, and that, that's it's still that's, pretty that's big, about, isn't it's, it? It's I a mean, mega it's a megabyte a minute. But I mean, although that's still fairly big, the fantastic thing is that it's uh, it's still in CD quality. It's still forty four point one kilohertz. So it's it's you not can barely uh, tell the difference. It's not like it's not like that real audio thing where it goes. <laughs> no, where, oh, no, it's it's not a streaming format. It's it's right. like it's like the old style WAVs, mm -hmm. where you have to download the whole thing and then you just load it up in your Winamp or Macamp player right. and then you, you just hear it. And if you've got all your CDs at home, and I believe that this is legal, you just sit there, you put them in your CD-ROM drive, you have a piece of software called a Ripper, yeah. and you just choose the tracks you want, and it just, it just rips them off the CD Ripper, drive. sounds very legal, Dave. <laughs> and, um, yes, player, right. which is exactly what Hugo has done. I see. And, uh, now we're ready to play music. Fantastic. So, how much music have have you got stored on it on that on that hard drive in there? On this one, this is a, a two gig disc, which is about the smallest laptop one you can get, and uh, there's about 500 singles on it, um, categorised by artist and year. Um, so, if I feel like tunes from sort of 1985, I just do 1985 and off it goes. All oh, right. So, like, so, so, and you just tie that once again into your little keypad. Yeah. Well, if you look at the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Start to enter year 1985. If you're listening to uh, some Blur and you want another Blur song next, but it's on random play. If you hit eight, it resorts all the random list going on ahead so that you, the next tune you get will also be a Blur one, which is quite good if you're like, particularly in the mood, it comes up with Blur in random play and you want to hear more Blur. So is this the most intelligent car stereo you've ever seen? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, currently, the, the commercial one's going to be an awful lot more intelligent. I mean. Uh, the other one has got over 200 MIPS of processing power, so, um, you know, it's the most powerful car stereo you've ever seen, probably. Um, there aren't many other car stereos which will sort of run Emacs and things like that. Do you ever worry that, like, uh, a device like this might be, might be just, uh, just pandering to people like the MP3 traders? who will be, be sitting there thinking, great, now I can take my, my whole collection out on the road. Well, I mean, if, if they own illegal MP3s anyway, I mean, it's just as illegal whether they've got them on their PC or in their car. It really makes no difference at all. If they've got them in the car, they can get pulled over by a policeman with an Ethernet cable and uh, get chucked out for that. But um, it's not very likely, really. I mean, it's uh, everyone makes tapes of their CDs for the car. I mean, no one expects you to buy a CD to listen to inside and a tape of exactly the same thing for the car. So um, I, I don't think record companies should be surprised or alarmed, really, at all. Um, the whole MP3 
thing, the actual thing about compressing music and being able to have an awful lot on your hard disk is, um, is a problem they've got to sort of face up to and do something about. If you could buy tunes, then people probably would. If they were cheaper than the CD, because there's no distribution costs, then this would be good. But um, I'm, I wouldn't hold my breath for it, to be honest. There you go. Ah, so, say I wanted to know more about uh, Hugo's mobile music playing invention <laughs> then, Dave. Well, why would you want that, Dan? You can't, you can't even drive. Yeah, yeah, I know, but say I was a viewer and I did, Dave. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, right. right. Well, obviously, uh, you'd go to our webpage, which is at um, www.tvchannel.co.uk. Uh -huh. And say I wanted to know more about the crazy world of virtual reality and do-it-yourself technology, Dave. I'd suggest that you try watching part two. Well, I, I think I'm obliged to. Hmm? Dan, yes. what would you think if I told you that our next guest lived at the URL www.wmin.ac.uk slash tilde fowler c slash patcadigan.html? Mm, this is a tough one. We'll try the well, ac.uk. Okay, well, that's, we know that. that's, that's academic, but uh, a tilde Fowl Fowl C. C means that it's in the user directory of Fowler C. But I think the real clue uh, yeah. is in that .html, uh, which I think it's not the homepage of Pat Cadigan, is it? <laughs> it is. Yeah, right. It's the homepage of the Queen of Cyberpunk herself, Pat Cadigan, who's joining us now to tell us about her new book, Tea for an Empty Cup. Hi, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it that you'd like to know? I do, well, first of all, I, if I, I have read the book, but say Danny hasn't. How, say, how, say it was Dave's turn to do the reading this yes. week. Say I took the copy off him. Uh, like, how would, you, how would you sum it up? What would you say it was essentially about, without referring to the back of the book? Where without it referring to it. the back of the book, I would say that it, what you, what you could call it is a locked room police procedural murder mystery set in the future, mostly in virtual reality. I, I, I want to read it already. That's the I mean, crucial bit. Mostly in virtual reality, because, um, like, as, as the queen of cyberpunk, Pat, you will obviously be familiar with the concept of virtual reality as it was introduced by William Gibson. Your courtiers <laughs> must have mentioned it all the time. But yeah. <laughs> they, they, they was, who, who is, who's technically the, the king of cyberpunk? Is it William Gibson? I, I, well, you know, there's, there, no one has ever been called the king. What, what they <laughs> keep the calling Elvis, William uh, Gibson yeah. is, is the godfather for some reason. I think uh -huh. they mean it in the James Brown sense. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. So it's like the hardest working rather than virtual either. citizen of, you know, He of doesn't cyberpunk. kill off other cyberpunk authors. No, no, not okay, at all. Good. Not at all. But you were there in those early days with books like Sinners, of which this is a valuable early proof copy. Yes. And uh, I mean, and, and this, 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 uh, this has a virtual reality element as well. Am yes, I it, it does. It does have a, a, a virtual reality element. It's sort of actually uh, a kind of sort of description of the web in a vestigial way, um, which was the way I was experiencing the net at the time, um, by way mostly of, of copy rolling up uh, a TV monitor. Yeah, well, this this was this was 1991, wasn't it? So yes. Before like graphic stuff. Came no, no, that's and good old ASCII days. days. Yeah, well, actually, it was turned in in uh, late '89 and wasn't published till '91. Oh, oh. So, yeah, it was publishing did you, did schedules. You, did you really get the inspiration from the net, or, or was it? Were you drawing from other sources when you were from uh, this other kind of thing? cyberpunk books? No, <laughs> uh, not that I thought they did that. No. <laughs> People ask me all the time if I'm familiar with Neil Stevenson. <laughs> so, have uh, you read any of his stuff? Yeah. <laughs> you might yeah, like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I started working with a form of virtual reality before it was called virtual reality in 1980 when I started writing the stories that eventually became my first novel, Mind Players. And all of that novel takes place. I mean, not all of it, but you know, the major portion of the action takes place in what's called a neutral territory where people are supposed to be able to meet mind to mind. And then people started writing to me, explaining to me that I was writing about virtual reality. And, and I was like, oh, really? You know, that's, and, but it wasn't a mind to mind type of thing. You know, so yeah. I got I mean, overly excited. And, and, the, the, you know. They do say that there were always the, the, these sort of like echoes of virtual reality before the whole cyberpunk thing took off. Have, have you read The Dueling Machine by Ben Bova? 
No. <laughs> oh, 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 that's good. That's that. Uh, that admittedly is aimed at children. But that that that's about a sort of a mental universe that people go into and have duels in to settle arguments. Oh, I didn't know and, that. Day. And then they start getting killed in real life. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, but, uh, but uh, without giving away the plot of, <laughs> of what happens in Tea from an Empty Cup. No, but what happens in um, what happened to virtual reality, Pat? Because. It was huge, yeah, you know, in the eighties. We yeah. like every, everyone was. Like, Jaron Lanier was going around tucking his dreadlocks into yeah. the back everyone of his. Everyone was wearing their, their cyber mittens, and, mm. and uh, the, the, tomorrow's world wasn't complete without someone standing around <laughs> looking ridiculous. And uh, I mean, did, did the technology not live up to it? Or well, the problem is that technology always takes longer than it would seem to in a book. You know, in a book, you can say and. You know, what with one thing and another, like in The Princess Bride, 10 years passed. Well, 10 years takes a longer time to pass in real life. And the work goes on, and it's not very glamorous, and it's not, you know, terribly interesting to, to lean over and watch. The results are fascinating, but work in progress is, is seldom, you know, riveting, <laughs> you know. It's, it's not really a spectator sport. Um, However, with virtual reality, when you have to be in it, don't you? Well, yes, there's that. But I see actually a lot of virtual reality seeping into the culture. You know, in in the fact that uh, that you can get a helmet for your uh, for your video game. You know, and you can get a glove for it, and you can get a little a, a pad that will. You know, Do it's the, like the when you when you when you crash your your yeah when thing, you crash. Yeah. Or you can get, you know, an actual steering wheel and a, you know, and pedals. Or you can get this if if your parents are really prone to spoil you. You can get this carpet that you spread out in front of your TV monitor, and you can jump around on that. And the the character <laughs> on the screen will mimic your your actions. All right, I've got a question about the book. Yeah, it's a locked room murder mystery set in virtual reality. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Can you have locked rooms in virtual reality? Isn't that one of the big problems with VR, is that you just end up being able to go anywhere and do anything? Well, you see, the locked room in question is a real locked room ah. in what we have all decided consensually, or what they have decided consensually in the book, is to be outer reality or real reality. And, um, you and always the, need those sort yes, of disclaimers, don't you? do. <laughs> and the, the person in question was murdered in virtual reality. The virtual character was murdered in virtual reality. You aren't supposed to be able to murder someone for real if you murder their character, since there's no real weapon and there's no you know, real uh, uh, injury. And yet the person ends up sustaining the same lethal injury that his character sustained in virtual reality in a locked cubicle in which no one could get in, no one could get out without being seen. But the only way in and out of the room is through AR, as it's called, the artificial reality. You haven't sport it by telling no, that, No, 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 no. Oh, I think that, that, that it, is, it is sort of implicit is in the plot that that's what's happening. Is, is, is that one of the challenges of writing a good VR novel, the fact that um, there aren't any real limits? on what happens in virtual reality. So you can say, oh, and then suddenly a monster appeared and, and killed everyone. Yeah. Well, you it know. It was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> a they woke up, dream. it was all virtual reality. Uh, no, actually, well, there have been writers in the past, uh, uh, certain, certain mystery writers who have said, you know, if the story gets dull, just have a guy come through the door with a gun. <laughs> So, you know, it's like this is not something that's inherent with novels about virtual reality. The thing is, anything can't happen in virtual reality. Not permanently. Not for real, you know. Um, just the same way as if you dream that you fall off a cliff, you wake up before you, you know, before the impact. Um, or one hopes, if, you know, and if you don't, you're not dreaming. That's how you know. It is uh, clear from uh, reading the book that these, these are things that you are starting to think about. I mean, there's a very good bit about the legal implications where you say, well, effectively, everyone in virtual reality is lying. So nothing that anyone, could, <laughs> that anyone does there well, that, that could that, be you know, taken as evidence. Well, that comes, comes out of being an American. If I, if I did it without a legal precedent of, look, everyone's lying, you can't do anything about it, I would have a book about people suing each other. You know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so you, you've managed to avoid that. I mean, the other thing is clearly that, um, like, uh, to what extent were you influenced in your portrayal of, of 
artificial reality now by the fact that we are beginning to see things like you know these interactive quake games where where, like, where huge numbers of people are battling it out online and you're, and you're beginning to see certain certain issues ra raised there. I mean, for instance, that like, the access speed is the is the big one. As oh it turns yes. out, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's well, billable time and access speed. You know, those have been the big bugaboos of of getting online. But I haven't spent a lot of time in a pretend environment. But, yeah. but in that case, is, uh, is fiction your personal virtual reality then? Oh, I, I guess I'd have to say yes. It always, always has been, you know. Um, I, it always starts from there, you know. Storytelling is, is the virtual reality, you know. Pat, thanks very much. <laughs> Pop news, and who is the most bonkers old rock star trying to reinvent themselves as some sort of multimedia guru this week? Is it Dave Stewart, who's DaveStewart.com, calls itself the Sly Fi Network, and lists all of Dave's current nutty projects, including writing a screenplay with Carrie Fisher, an offbeat comedy set in a nail salon? Or could it be David Bowie, who's not at all pompously titled BowieNet, invites users to suggest lyrics for songs that he hasn't written yet, or talk to him via an amazing 360-degree internet camera or three-dimensional Bowie World graphical chat interface. Or perhaps is it Gary Newman, whose 80s pop hit Cars seems to be one of the few big-name tracks available on his highly publicised music trial site run by Brit anti-piracy organisation the Performing Rights Society. It's Bowie, isn't it? Yes, it is. It always is. Yeah, it's worth checking. Yeah, that's no, a good idea. And finally, we haven't yet seen the new Cameron Diaz comedy, There's Something About Mary, but the word is, it's disgusting. Disgustingly funny, that is. For an unpleasant taste of what to expect, the official site features no less than five shock wave <laughs> games, including one where you pop zits on a man's face, one where you stalk Cameron Diaz through her bedroom window, and one where you try to squirt her hair gel onto the head of chirpy comic Lee Evans. Like we said, we haven't seen the film yet, so we're unsure of the significance of the movie's Clean Your Pipes catchphrase. I do hope it's not rude. I thought so. And it would indeed be impolite not to check out how to get to all this nonsense by not visiting our website, which you get to by looking for our faces on the picture that appears after you type in the following internet page address. <coughs> www.tvchannel.co.uk Oh, UK. Yes. This was 404 Not Found, manfully helmed by data cowboys Dan O'Brien, c'est moi, and Dave Green. We'll be digitising ourselves back into the virtual cybersphere at the same time next week, but till then... Computer, end programme. End programme. Work in London, surf in Hawaii. Find out how you could do it too on Download with Sue Davis after the break.